Remember, we started last week, or maybe even the week before, with looking at noughts and crosses and thinking the rules for noughts and crosses are so simplistic and so simple that the game's not very interesting. And I thought, well, I should show you a more interesting game. Uh, and I thought of this game while I was having my bagel this morning. Um, it's, no, it's even more interesting than chess. And it's very fast. You've got triangles and circles and squares. And the shapes can either be uh, shaded in or they could, say, be hatched, or they could be left empty. Does that make sense? They're the legal things you've got. So you could have a, a shaded square, or a, uh, a, hat, a hatched square, or a shaded circle, and so on and so on. And we take turns in drawing a piece on the board. You're not allowed to draw a piece that someone else has already drawn. And the first person to get a collection of three shapes, which satisfy the following property, Win. Either they've all got to have the same shape or you've got to have one of each shape. And either they've all got to have the same fill or you've got to have one of each fill. Does that make sense? Who would like to play that game? Would you like to, don't say anything, would you like to play the game? What's your name? Kent. Kent. All right. What, what would you like to play first? Um, the triangle shaded. All right. I'm going to play a... Uh, a circle hatched. A square hatched. Oh. Um, all right, I'll go a, uh, a triangle and open. What's that? Have you just won? <laughs> oh, he did. He just beat me. Well done. Well done. That's awesome. Um, that's a pretty good game, isn't it? Um, how would you use uh, one variable from one function in another? Uh, how would you use a variable from one function in another function? Give me an example and we'll do it. So for example here, right? So you use here in leap and then you use it in doomsday. So how would you do that? Oh, okay. You want to know, um, you want to pass a value year into two functions. Is that right? So we've got what? Is leap year? Which takes in an int. And what else have we got? Doomsday. And that takes in, again, an int. And ret this, this returns an int. And this returns an int. This will return 0 or 1, depending if it's true or false. And this will return a number between 0 and 6, saying which day of the year it is. Uh, well, who's, who's using these functions? Um, so main might need to use them, but I'm thinking one of your other functions might need to use them. Next Thursday, next, next Thursday might need to do it. Okay, so what does next Thursday take in? Takes in a month, uh, what? Uh, month, day, and year. I don't, that can't be the right order. Is it year, month, day? Takes in three integers, year, month, and day. And I'm just calling it NT rather than next Thursday so I can be lazy with my typing. So next Thursday, let's define the function next Thursday then. How many days till next Thursday is it? Well, what do we need to know? First of all, we need to know which day of the year this is, this date is. So we probably need to set a, a variable up called um, day. Maybe it's called day of week or something. Which day of the week is it? Day of week. And then you'd say day of the week equals, now you've got a function. Oh, is there a function called day of the week? That's probably not a good variable name then. Uh, let's just call it day. Fortunately, we've got two days in the function now. Hmm, that's not good. Maybe we're going to call this... Maybe we're going to call this day number. Oh, day of month. Let's call this day of month. Yep, now we're not going to confuse them. So there's a day of the month that's like a number between 1 and 31. And there's a day, which is a day of the week, which is a number between 0 and 6. And the day of that date is what? Uh, it's equal to day of week. And then how do you call day of week? What do you have to pass into it? 
You need to pass in the doomsday. And what else do you need to pass in? Is it a leap year? And what else do you need to pass in? Month. And what else do you need to pass in? Now, this is how um, we normally write programs, is that we do the big picture first. So we're saying, OK, this is the answer. Then really, all I need to do is what? Return day. Is that all I need to do? No, I need to do a calc now. If it's day three and Thursday is day zero, how many days till next Thursday? Four more days. Yeah, so there's some formula here that you'll have to work out. That, yeah, you, you sounds like you know. So using this information, I, I work out days to go, some formula, and then at the, I'll just go return days to go. Now, this is how I'd write the program. I'd actually literally write it something like this. Even though at the moment this thing isn't going to work because I haven't filled in a lot of the details, a really good way of writing programs is you just get the big picture right first, then you relax. You think, woohoo, I've done it. <coughs> to, to work out how many days till next Thursday, all I've got to do is work out what day of the week it is now, and then I do a small calculation on that to work out how many days there are to go, and I return that, and I'm finished. Woohoo, I've done the assignment. And then after a while you think, oh, hang on, but I haven't written this function yet. But that's okay. We come back to that later on. What we've done is we've broken this big problem now into a slightly smaller problem. Not only do I need to write this function, but I also need to know the current doomsday for this year, and I need to know if it's a leap year or not. How am I going to work those two things out? Does someone want to suggest? Yeah, I'm going to get other functions to work them out. Whenever I see a problem, I'm just going to break it into functions, and each of those functions are going to do part of the problem. So I'm going to insert in here. Let me just expand that out. It's not so easy to insert in a blackboard, so I'll just pull it out here. First of all, I need to work out what the doomsday is. So I'll say something like int doomsday. Doomsday equals, how can I find the doomsday for the current year? I've got a function that does it. Yeah, so I'll just call that. Year to doomsday. And I've typed it into the browser so you can see, into a text file so you can see what it looks like. We're just looking at a sample solution for days till next Thursday. The interesting things to notice, really, are the process that we go through to write a function. We've got to write a function called days till next Thursday, which given a date, year, month, day, works out how many days it is till the next Thursday. That seems like a complicated thing to work out. So our trick is always not to get stressed and to relax and solve the problem, not completely, just in terms of other problems. So we say, oh, th you could say, oh, that's really hard, I'm going to freak out. Or you could go, oh, no, man, that's really easy. All I have to do is work out the day of the week of this date, and then I have to do some pretty simple calculation, and that'll tell me the number of days till next Thursday. Do you agree? If you could work out the day of the week of a particular date, it's very easy to work out how many days till next Thursday with a simple calculation. If I said the day of the week is Saturday, what would you say um, the number of days till the next Thursday? Five. Okay, so you can do that calculation simple enough. If you can do it in your head, you can work out... Um, a little algebraic expression or formula or something or some ifs here to work that out. So that's not hard. So we've solved the problem. So we go, woohoo, and we go to bed, relax, because we've finished the assignment. And then the next day we wake up and we say, well, it was all finished except for this small amount of detail, which is I haven't actually written uh, day, uh, the thing to calculate days of the week yet. So then we go the next night to write that function. And similarly, we break that into subparts and subparts. And that's how we, the general approach to solving problems. Now, someone asked how we link functions together. So here's how you do it. Um, we say, when I call day of the week to work out the day of the week, I need to know if it's a dooms what the doomsday of that year is. I need to know if that year's a leap year or not. I need to know the month of the date, and I need to know the day of the date. Well, I already know the month and the day because they were passed in to me. They were given to me by the person asking the original question. But what I don't know is the doomsday for that year, and I don't know if that year's a leap year or not. So I better calculate those two things. How do I calculate those two things? Well... Easy, I'll create a variable called doomsday and I'll say it's equal to the doomsday of the given year. And I'll call some function that works that out for me. Woohoo! Now I can go to bed and relax. Tomorrow when I wake up, I think, oh, actually I've got to write that function. So I've got to do a bit more detail. But you see, the idea is you get it working at a high level and then the next day you, you tackle the, the problem. Oh, it's a completely new problem. You've never seen it before. But notice the interesting thing about new problems is it's much smaller than the original problem. And if you iterate that a couple of times, eventually the problems you're trying to solve are so small that you can just solve them straight away. So writing, solving, writing one long big piece of code to work this whole thing out, that would be hard. But breaking it into subparts and solving each of the subparts, that's easy. Similarly, I needed to know if it was a leap year or not. So I'll create a variable called leap year, and I'll give it a value, 
which is the value returned by an is leap year function. And the job of the is leap year function is to work out if it's a leap year or not. Now I can go to bed and relax. And the next day I wake up and I go, oh, I've got to write is leap year. I haven't written that yet. But does, does that make sense? This is what we call top-down design. You write the most, the biggest, boldest um, thing you're trying to do first, and you break it into slightly smaller problems. And then you write solutions for each of those smaller problems, and you break them into smaller problems, and so on, and you iterate that. Does anyone have any questions about that at all? Yes, one, then two. Um, I've just written out the program and yes. it tells you, like, at the end of the day, what the information is. Yes. Should I then split that up and write it into functions and then... Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think what you're saying is you've essentially written a very, very long function to compute this. Should you break that into sub-functions? And what do you think I'm going to say? Yes. Yes. Yes, you think I'm going to say yes? You don't want me to because you don't want to go and change your program. But... But actually, I think that's a really astute question you asked. If I, if I showed you this and said, oh, you can probably see it. It's probably not complicated enough. Is this in a knot? If I pull them both ends, would this form a knot or not? Or not? <laughs> that's quite a hard question to answer. And you're looking at it, and it's really complex. But you could do all sorts of clever thinking and solve that problem. And then in the lecture, I could say, oh, there's a simpler way of solving that problem, which is you divide this extension cord into sub-extension cords, and you solve it for each of those. Or suppose that was possible. You could say, well, I've already solved it once for the big problem. Do I need to break it into sub-problems and solve it, given I know the solution for this? And the answer is, I reckon it's worth breaking it into the sub-problems, because even if you think you've got this right, this big complex problem, just staring at it, it's really hard to check it. So it's like the estimation of how many things fill in the room. Just because you think your program's right, it might not be because it's quite complex. And incomplexity hides a potential for error. And it might be wrong in some really subtle way that your test cases don't pick out. But if you break it into subparts and test all the subparts independently, it turns out the um, composite thing you build by joining subparts together is much more reliable. So yeah, I would. I would do that if I were you. A general rule of computer science is um, your function should never be long. If we were prog programming in Java, for example, We'd want all your functions to be ridiculously short and, and just have means and means of functions. Certainly, a function should never go off the screen. So if your function doesn't fit on the screen, and I'm thinking with a pretty big font, then it's probably too big. It's, it's got big enough that it should be split into sub-things. Each function should do one thing and one thing only. It should have one job. It should be specialized. So if you've got a function that does 50 things, break them into 50 sub-functions. Give each of them a name that clearly describes each of those sub-things they do, and then join them together in a sen sensible way. You don't have to do it for correctness, but for clarity, it's fantastic. It makes really clear what you were saying. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you had a question then. Uh, so with day of week function, can we give it functions uh, yeah thank you I'm glad you asked that question Can I? we could do this notice leap year is a variable that stores true or false one or zero in C speak um, and that is given its value by calling the is leap year function we could do this watch this piece of magic I'm going to remove the function and stick it in here yeah that's what you're asking yeah, yeah, absolutely you can do that. Now let's look at it. Uh, day is the next, uh, weekday because day of the week, give, it's given the doomsday, it's given is the year, year a leap year, the month and the day. So this function will call, be called first because it's inside the brackets. You know, it's, well, not because it's inside the brackets, just because it needs to be evaluated first. That's how C evaluates its arguments. So it'll call is leap year on year first, work out what value this returns, and then it will stick that value in this spot and it will be as though you pass that number in directly. This is simultaneously a good and a bad thing to do. Uh, in this case, I think it's quite good because the name of the function is very, very clear and tells you what's going on. And the amount of work it's doing is very small. So it's not really adding much complexity to this whole line. And I think the fact that it makes everything a bit smaller actually here adds to the clarity of the whole thing and spreading it out and assigning it to variables and using the variables because it spreads the logic out a little bit. I think I find that slightly less clear. But... If you went completely nuts and tried to put everything as function calls in here and didn't store any intermediate values in variables, then you might find this line becomes quite long and many things are being done on the line and that's definitely bad. Our rule of thumb is you should do only one thing on each line. On this line, we're doing two things. That's okay. I'd be nervous about doing three. I certainly wouldn't do four. Yeah, yeah. Try and do as little as possible in each step. You probably know that at home when you're doing a job. 
or if you're describing to someone else how to do a job. You're giving someone instructions. Ah, you're telling someone how to uh, directions in a car. You're driving and they're saying, how do I get to Marrickville Metro? And you go, well, now you could give an enormously long, complicated description right now, but what's probably going to happen is they're going to get lost if they're like me. Better would be to say, just go down this road for a bit. And then in a few minutes you go, we're coming up to a place where you're going to turn right. And you break it into a series of sub things, and that way it's easier to get it right and less hard to get it wrong. So I wouldn't try and do lots of things in one line. Break it into a series of lines doing one thing in each line. Okay, so for example, we could stick year to doomsday in here, but actually I find that less clear. Here, this line as I read it now, more or less reads in English like what it's doing. I want to know the day of the week, given the doomsday, given is it the year a leap year, given a month and given a day. But if I also stuck the year to doomsday thing in, if I just got, went nuts with this idea of saving space, oh, I have to kill that line now. Now look at what we've got. We've got a very long line already. I'm a bit worried about that. If I wanted to format it nicely, I guess I could drop it all to the next line and do something like that or something, I guess. But now I want another day of the week given year to doomsday of year. That's actually a roundabout way of saying the doomsday. I felt it was clearer when the word doomsday was there, given the doomsday, not given the year to doomsday of the year, even though year to doomsday of the year obviously will be a doomsday, but does that make sense? It, it's now slightly more confusing, I think, more cluttered. So I wouldn't suggest doing that, but the, the other one I thought was fine. Any more questions? Do you think that we should define true and false or something for one and zero? Yeah, you should define true and false if you're using trues and falses in your program. Uh, and if true and false pops up, then yeah, define them. Don't use ones and zeros. Is leap year should return true, which is one. Yeah, is leap year should return true. Well, um, depends how you write is leap year. If you're, there are five different ways of writing is leap year that I know of, because they're in your tute this week, where we show you five different ways of writing it. You'll see they all. This problem arises in some and not in others. And in fact, in your tute, you'll be asked to decide which looks nicer and which doesn't look nicer and what are the strengths and weaknesses of five all equally correct versions of leap year. And you'll probably be able to think of many other ways of writing leap year too. Yes? Uh, don't we have to uh, redefine the function back up there if we're using year to do thing as leap year instead of the Ah, good question. No, no, let me ref no, we don't. And it's really pleasant that we don't. So that's a really good question. The, the question he was asking is, if we pass in, instead of passing in, uh, let me just go back to the way it was. Now I'm passing in here. The question was, do I need to change the type signature of the function? Does day of the week, the day of the week function, it was expecting, what was it expecting there? It was expecting a Boolean, yeah, an int, yeah. And now I'm, it looks like I'm giving it a function. Does that mean I'm breaking the type rules? Does someone want to say, it turns out it's okay, why not? Yeah. Yeah, the function returns an integer. I thought you had to uh, name it specific, like with your .h file, you specifically named the variable. Ah, the names of the variables I put in the pr a prototype at the front yeah. are just placeholders. They don't mean anything. Oh. So you can change that name. We talked about that in the last lecture. Oh, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Do I need to say that again? You remember we put the function prototypes at the top and someone asked, it's got the type signature information in there. It's also got some names of variables. Do the names of variables matter? No, they're just there for informational purposes. The type is all the compiler cares about. Uh, does that mean that we don't need to put the name of the variable? You don't need to put the name of the variable? Yeah, you can probably get away without doing it. I've never tried. I'm sure when I first learned C, I discovered whether you could or not, but you would be mad to leave them out. Because the idea of the prototype is you're giving information about the function. The compiler demands it because the compiler wants to know the type information, but since that line's there, it's a perfect opportunity for you to give information to the reader. So help them as much as possible, so give them good variable names. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, why are you saying that meters correspond, the variable meters correspond to the type, and you said that it didn't matter that it has to be the same name or not? What if you're passing, passing in two variables, then how would they correspond to one another? Uh, when you pass the variables in, all the function so here we're using the function right, and down here somewhere it's defined. All that matters is the order here. So the first thing that's passed in when you use it goes to the first thing in the definition, regardless of the names matching up. The second thing to the second, the third to the third. It's like me doing this. Okay. Um, can you just stand up for a second? I'm going to 
tell you the names of two guys. Guy A and Guy B. And then I'm going to either do this if I think Guy A is best and I want you to say Guy A, or this if it's Guy B and I want you to say Guy B. Yeah, yeah? Okay. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Guy A. Who is... I'm telling you two people called Guy A and Guy B for the purposes of this description. Okay. But when I give you the two people, you'll actually know their names. Okay. So I'm going to tell you Guy A, then I'm going to tell you Guy B. Okay. And this is A, this is B. Uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. <laughs> Did I just get it backwards? Yeah. <laughs> From my side. See, I'm backwards to you. Uh, so that's A, that's B. <laughs> is that all right? This, is, th this example is more confusing than the actual point I'm trying to make. This is A. Okay, that's the A sign. So, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. Fred Astaire. Yes! Uh, and now I'm going to... Uh, you say two names. Um, Jim and Bob. Jim and Bob. Bob. Yes! I've given him one definition of what to say. I haven't said... If I'm saying Jim and Bob and I do this, I want you to say Bob, and then, uh, and then, then I'll tell him for Fred. I've given him one definition. In that definition, I use the made-up names Guy A and Guy B. I'm not expecting anyone will actually ever say guy A and guy B to him. Someone might, but I'm not expecting that. But can you see, in that definition, all that matters was guy A was the first one and guy B was the second one. It's the same in the fun... You can sit down, sorry. Thank you. You did that very well. Uh, it's the same in the definition down here. It just matters which is the first, which is the second, which is the third. What names we give them inside here doesn't matter. Guy A, guy B, B Joe Blow, Wilma Smith... It doesn't matter because, remember, those variables only live as long as this function lives and they die when this function returns to the outside world. So what happens is when you call the function, and actually this is a really important point, when you call the function, the function sets the memory aside and it copies the names, the stuff you give it into that memory and uses it, and then at the end of the function it throws it away. So if you pass in two variables, it copies the values of those variables into the function works on those copies, and then when the function's finished, it just throws those copies away. So it's not working on the original data. So now, what was your question? Inside here, I can give them different names. Oh, I've got to say what everything is, don't I? Int, uh, I could just call it int d, if I wanted. Int guy2. Int guy3. Int guy1. And that means when it's called, whoever's, whatever's passed in here is going to get copied into that, into D. Whatever's typed in here, whatever this function returns in this case, is going to get copied into guy2. And notice this is essentially declaring a new D, a new guy2. This is the temporary stuff that gets created and gets destroyed when the function leaves. A temporary thing called guy1 gets created and the day gets copied into that. Now while this is completely legal, can you see it's quite confusing. These names aren't helping us at all work out what's going on. In fact, because we've got the number ordering wrong, it's even confusing. It's like very error prone. So we always try and give meaningful and good names whenever possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was a great question. And the important thing to notice out of all of that was at the instant the function's called, down here it makes temporary copies of everything. And this is really important because later on, I'm going to pass some information to you in functions and you're going to want to change what I'm giving to you. But because you're working on a copy, you're going to find it very difficult. Does that make sense? So this is actually going to be a dilemma we face in a couple of weeks. You only ever work on copies. I wish life was like that, but too often you work on the original and whoops.